Philippians chapter number 1 this morning. This is the third message in our series on the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number 1 will be in verses 12 through 19 this morning. We'll read that and then we'll pray. The Bible says in verse number 12, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospels, gospels, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set forth for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we're thankful for the book of Philippians. God, we're thankful uh, for the church at Philippi and that they went on in your name. God, help us today as we study your word. God, help us to get something out of it. God, help me uh, to preach your word. Help me not to say anything you wouldn't have me to say. God, hide me behind the cross and fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have you ever met someone that no matter how bad their life was, it seemed like everything was awesome? They're just bubbly, they're happy, they're, they have a, a, a personality that's just contagious. Uh, they, they could have had the worst day of their life, but, at, but they still are happy. How many of you have ever met somebody like that? They're kind of frustrated, to be honest. I'm like, man, just, it's okay to be upset. But no, they're, they're rejoicing. And when I think about the Apostle Paul, that is what I think about this guy had been through so much, and yet at the end of the day, when he was writing the book of Philippians, the key word to Philippians was joy and rejoice. That's amazing to me that Paul, being in a Roman prison, every hour of every day, was still having joy and still rejoicing. He had every reason to be complaining and to be murmuring. Every reason. You know, we go through a lot less and we complain a lot more. He had every reason, but he didn't. He had one thing on his mind, and that was the gospel. We could all take some lessons from him. The first thing we see in Philippians chapter number 1 is Paul's plea. Paul started off pleading with the church at Philippi. He says, but I would, ye should understand, brethren. He's saying, I need you to get something. I need you to understand something. Paul is ready to encourage them to go forward for the cause of Christ. He calls them brethren, reminding them that they're on the same team. It's like us when we say brother or sister. We're, we're reminding each other that we're on the same team. We're a church that's unified for one cause, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is reminding this church at Philippi. Hey, no matter what's happening in your life, our one job, our one responsibility is to the furtherance of the gospel. Paul is also going to give them some insight into what he, why he does what he does. We think about, uh, he says, the things which happened unto me have fallen out. If you turn over to 2 Corinthians, you can find out a little bit about what Paul is talking about here. Second Corinthians chapter number 11. In verses 22 through 30, uh, 23 through 33, the Bible says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in laborers, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting, uh, fasting often, in cold and nakedness. 
beside those things that are with, without, that which cometh upon me daily, that the care of all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is offended, I and I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not in Damascus, uh, the governor under Archites, the king kept the city in uh, Damascus and with garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And uh, through a window in a basket was I let down by a wall and escaped his hand. So Paul just went, up, went on a full laundry list of what's all happened to him. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He's been lost at sea. He's been thrown in prison. He's had, he's had brethren. Be, picking on him, he's had, he's had his own countrymen picking on him, he's had all these things happening to him, and so when he says the things which happened unto me, that's what he's talking about, he's talking about all the, all the pain and all the suffering that he's gone through. So he says, but I, I would, you should understand brethren, the things happened unto me. So he said, hey listen guys, all these things happened unto me, and I'm going to tell you why, there's a reason. I, I, these things didn't happen for, for no reason, these things happened for a reason. We think about one of my favorite hymns is called When We See Christ. The first verse in the course goes like this. Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur, and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch His bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. No matter what happens in our life, at the end of the day we have a promise that we're going to see Jesus face to face. Amen. And we can rejoice in the suffering because at the end of our life, that suffering will be forever put away. There's no tears in heaven. There's no crying. There's no weeping. There's only rejoicing in heaven. And we only, the only thing we're going to do in heaven is praise God. All the pain, all the sorrow, all the sickness, there won't be any eyeglasses, there won't be any fake legs, there won't be any prosthetics, there won't be anything like that in heaven. Because at the end of the day, we'll be rejoicing when we see Jesus face to face because of who He is. You know, I, use, I, I like to use hymns in my sermons a lot. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I like to use hymns because the, these hymns are not old-fashioned. Right? These hymns are not old-fashioned. They're timeless. They convey timeless truths of the Scripture. And that's why at Washington Street Baptist Church, we still use the hymnal. It's because at the end of the day, those truths in the, the, that hymn book are timeless. We say we're old-fashioned. No, we're not old-fashioned. We're preaching the same thing that Jesus Christ was preaching when He was on the earth. At the, end of the, at the end of that, it says, the things which happened to me have fallen out. That, that phrase means, have occurred. So all these things have happened to me, and why? Why did all these things happen to me? Why did I have to go through all these bad things? It doesn't make any sense. And to us, our finite minds, it might not make any sense what, why we're going through the trial we're going through, but God has a reason. Verse number 12, at the end of it says, but have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul could have easily gotten discouraged. I don't know about you, but whenever things don't go my way, I can get a little bit grouchy. I can get a little bit grumpy, and I don't like it. And Paul, obviously, a lot of things didn't go his way. He went from being a Jew of the Jews to being thrown in prison by the Jews. He went from being a, a premier leader in the Jewish church to being a prisoner of the Jewish church. Paul could have easily gotten discouraged and after all that he had gone through to get where he is today. He went from traveling the world, spreading the gospel, to being confined to chains. It would have been easy for him to quit, but he didn't. He looked back on all that he had gone through and saw that it was gain. For the cause of Christ. The pain, the suffering, the shipwrecks, getting beat, all of it was for the cause of Christ. And so today, we don't, we're not getting beaten every time we come to church. We're not getting beaten every time we talk to someone about Jesus. We're not. We, we don't know persecution like the Apostle Paul knew persecution. 
And so what should we do? When things don't always go our way, we got to go on. we got to go on for the cause of Christ because we are God's instruments that He's using in this day. It's us. God could have chosen anything. God could have made the rocks cry out. But instead He chose to use us. And we ought not, we ought not take advantage of that. Paul's goal, no matter the trial or tribulation he had to go through, was spreading the gospel. Rather than complaining or even quitting when the Christian life gets hard, we should remember that God can make the wrath of man bring praise to him. Psalm chapter number 76 verse 10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Even the wrath of man can pr bring praise to God. So when, next time someone... Might take might, someone might be mean to you about spreading the gospel. You might be giving them a track and slam the door in your face. Just remember that God can turn that into praise. Then he says, verse number thirteen: So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all the places. We might not understand the reason we are going through something, but I promise that God has a plan. If we turn to Romans chapter number eight. It's a really good verse. Romans chapter number 8. Verse number 28. The Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. We can know that no matter what trial or tribulation we go through, that God is meaning it for good. God has meant everything for good. We think about Joseph, Joseph's life. At the end of Joseph's life, when his dad had died, and his brothers were like, please don't kill us, he says, you thought it was evil, but God meant it for good. Think about Job. Job had a bunch of bad stuff happen to him, didn't he? He lost his family. He lost his, he lost his barns. He lost his cows. He lost his donkeys. He, lost, he really even, he almost lost his wife. His wife said, curse God and die. She didn't understand it. But Job knew at the end of the day that no matter what the trial, no matter the tribulation, that God was going to work it for his good. Even if Paul didn't understand why at the time, God would reveal it to him. God, you know, we think about the Apostle Paul. As he's being beaten in prison, as he's sitting in prison, most of us, myself included, would be saying, woe well, is me. I'd be, oh man, I'm still in chains, wake up. Paul, look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is telling others about Jesus. <coughs> Him and Silas in the book of Acts had a Christian music concert. And they, the doors came open and, and the Philippian jailer was saved because of it. They were all the things that Paul had gone through and Paul was still spreading the gospel. And that's our job as Christians. A church who fails to do the Great Commission fails to be a church. If we're not spreading the gospel, we're not a church, we're a social gathering. We must share the gospel. Think about the reach that Paul had. He did more in bondage than I think I could ever do as a free man. It says, uh, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. So apparently he had some converts in Caesar's palace. That's amazing. Where he was jailed in, in, the, in the courtroom or whatever where he was jailed, people were saved because of it out of Caesar's house. And in all the places, no matter where the Apostle Paul was, he was spreading the gospel. Over and over in the New Testament, as the persecution got more, the gospel spread more. Think about all the times in the book of Acts. Whenever things were starting to die down with the church, what happened? There was some persecution and the church was rekindled. And, and, and it just continued to spread. As soon as it got stagnant in one place, God would send someone to persecute the church and then the church would move on. No, we, we, we have to remember that. So God is God's church will not die. God's church cannot die. Upon this rock have I built my church. God is talking about His church is going to go on. With or without us. God has allowed us to be instruments. And I'm super thankful that I have the opportunity to be an instrument for God. But God can do it without me. But God has given us the opportunity to be used of Him. 
Paul's plea to the church at Philippi was simply spread the gospel no matter the cost. He's saying, hey, it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be people who don't like you. But at the end of the day, we must spread the gospel no matter the cost. As I was studying for this, I remembered this poem that I learned in college. We, in my English class and then in my church learning class, we had to memorize this poem and present it. Uh, and I don't have it memorized anymore, so I had to remember the words so I could look up what the poem was called. The poem was called Don't Quit. And the last stanza of this poem says, Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint in the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you mustn't quit. Why, why would they have us read that in church learning class? Why? Because things are hard. You know, things don't always go our way, and, and things are, they're, it's tough. No, but at the end of the day, when things seem the toughest, that's when we must go the furthest. Louis Insminger, who was the song director of the First Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, when Jeffrey Norris was there, it is said that when he was in seminary, he would get up in chapel and uh, he would speak to the preacher boys and he would say these, this phrase over and over and over. Every chapel service that he had, he would say this. He would say, go on, go on, go on. As Christians, we must go on. No matter the persecution, no matter the trial that we're facing, God is bigger than any trial that we could face. God has the answer to every, every problem that we have in our life. God has the answer. We have to trust Him. We must trust Him. So we see Paul's plea. The next, we see the motives of the pastors around him. Verse number 14 says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Have you ever noticed being around someone who's enthusiastic is contagious? Like when someone is enthusiastic, it's a lot easier for you to be enthusiastic. Someone who's happy is contagious. When someone smiles at you, most of the time it's, a lot, it's easy to smile back, right? But on the other end of the spectrum, when, someone's, when you're around someone who's grumpy, it's easy to be grumpy. When someone is cantankerous or contentious, it's, it's easy to be that way. And so Paul knew this. So this is exactly what was happening to the followers of Paul. As Paul was more bold in prison, the Christians that were following Paul, who was following Christ, became more bold. The Roman Christians saw Paul in chains awaiting trial in Rome. I'm sure they somewhat expected him to be discouraged, but what they found was quite the opposite. They found Paul still witnessing like he did when he wasn't in prison, and it inspired them. My pastor, Pastor Crawford, in 2020, during the whole COVID situation, preached a lot about adversity. And he preached a lot from Romans chapter number 8. Because there was a lot of adversity that everyone was facing. There was uncertainty. Uh, he was leading a church through a global pandemic for the first time ever. And so there was a lot of adversity. And so he, would, he said this over and over. He said adversity is common in life. But how Christians respond should be uncommon. There's going to be adversity in your life. There's going, to be, there's going to be pain. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be trials. But how we respond as Christians should be uncommon to man. When they look at a Christian who's going through a trial, they shouldn't say, oh, I knew that was going to happen. They should say, wow, how, did, how are they that joyful? Think about Paul rejoicing in bonds. I get, I get grumpy when I don't get enough food. Right? And yet Paul here was in, in jail, beaten and all these things, and he was still rejoicing. So adversity is common in the Christian life, but how we respond as Christians should be uncommon. When they look at us, they should see a difference. The way Paul handled adversity gave the Roman Christians boldness to preach. Romans chapter number 1, verses 14 through 16, says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise 
and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We have power through Jesus Christ. We have the power to overcome no matter what the trial, no matter what the tribulation. We have the power through Jesus Christ. As we see the world waxing worse and worse, we ought to be more bold. We have to preach more. We have to we have to we have to talk about our faith more. Because I don't know about you guys, but I don't want people to die and go to hell. Now, when I look, when, when we, it's it's really easy with this main Washington Street drive going past us. You might not be able to see the cars, but you can hear the cars passing by. And over and over and over, as we're in service today, you'll hear cars passing by. Who knows how many? Fifty, a hundred. And those people might not know about Jesus. And what are we doing about it? What are we doing? I want, at the end of my life, to know that I gave everything I had for the cause of Christ. And so should you. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning, that God has put a witness inside of each of us. And we have to share that witness. We have to be bold in our witness. It's what God has called us to do. Verse number 15 says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. We have to be careful of our motives. Paul's motives were right. But there were some, there were some pastors who were preaching that their motives weren't right. They were preaching out of envy and strife. They were envious of Paul, and they were they, they, they didn't like what he was doing. They didn't like that he was getting all this glory and all this. He was in the limelight. We need to check our motives. Why are we doing what are we doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? Our motives matter. If we're telling people about God for our own personal gain, it doesn't. It, it's it's void. It's empty. But if we're doing what we do, and we're telling people about Jesus for the cause of Christ. It, it brings glory to him. I think about when I was in Bible college, we had these little Christian. I can't remember what they're called, but we had to fill this piece of paper that this how many church services I attended this week. Uh, this is how many tracts I handed out. This how many gospel presentations I gave. And there were some people who was like, well, they'd be honest. You know, you put like, oh, I went to all three services. I passed out five tracts. And I presented the gospel to one person. And then there'd be people who were like, I went to 25 church services. And I went, I passed out 255 tracts and, and all this stuff. And they were doing it for their own glory. And at the end of the day, no matter what we do, we ought to do everything we do for the glory of God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the quantity as long as the quality is good. If what you're doing is for God, it doesn't matter. Just do what you can for God. Some were preaching goodwill. We have to be preaching goodwill. Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 1 says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Think about Moses. Moses, whenever God was getting ready to judge the Israelites, he says, God judge me and let the Israelites live. That's how we, that's how we ought to be as Christians. We ought to say, you know, God, whatever your will, I want your will to be done. I don't want my will to be done. I, want, I don't want to do this my own glory. God, I want you to get all the glory. That's why we have to be very careful that we give every, everything we do, every good thing that we've done, uh, God ought to get the glory. Because we're just instruments. Amen. Amen. We're, we're just tools that God is using. But God is doing all the work. Verse number 16 says, The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add to add affliction to my bonds, it's about to get a little. It's about to get a little humorous in how Paul responds to this. But there were some people who were preaching contention and self ambition. We have to be careful that we don't rejoice in someone else's pain. These people were rejoicing in the pain that Paul had and saying they were they were preaching Christ, but they were preaching it, and they were they were they were really um, being contentious towards Paul. The theme of Philippians chapter number 1 is Christ my life. And when he is your life, all the hate around you 
can be like water on a duck's back, right? It just rolls off. The people preaching like this thought that they would make Paul's imprisonment worse. But then in verse number 18, we'll get back to verse number 17, but in verse number 18 it says, Not what then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, will rejoice. So he's saying, you guys think that you're really messing with me, but at the end of the day, if Christ is preached, Christ is glorified. And every, every time we stand in the pulpit, every time someone gets in this pulpit to preach or to teach, Christ ought to be glorified. He ought to be lifted up. He ought to be praised and worshipped because of who He is. And so Paul was saying, you guys thought that this was going to be bad for me. You thought that you guys were going to make me mad and you thought you were going to get me worked up in this, in this prison cell. But if Christ is preached, I, Christ is glorified. And I will glory in that. I will rejoice in that. Verse number 17 says, But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. There were some, some people were preaching contention and envy and strife, and they were trying to stir up the pot. But then there was others who were preaching out of love, and that's our motivator ought to be the love of Christ. There should never be any hate spoken. We ought to hate sin, but we, we ought to love the sinner as Christ did. Sin is sin, and we can never overlook sin, but we can love a sinner. And he says, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. He was, he was ready to defend the gospel no matter the cost. And we should too. And we have, we have college students in here that will go to college and they'll learn all kinds of weird stuff. They'll learn about evolution. They'll learn about uh, this theory that we were all monkeys and now look at us. They'll learn about this thing where everything appeared out of nothing. It was just goop. But where did the dupe come from for them to make it? But that's, that's another point. But they're going to need to know the Bible. And they, they need to hear the Bible taught no matter what age group. So from the time that they're four years old or even in the nursery, they, they ought to be hearing the truth. Not only from the people here, because we only have them for an hour. Maybe. What are we doing with the other hours that they're at their house? They ought to know the love of Christ through us. We have to give them the ability to defend their faith. It shouldn't just be mom and dad's faith. It should be my faith. Verse number 19 says, For I know that this shall turn my salvation through your prayer in the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul wanted people to be saved. He wanted his people to be saved. He wanted no matter what they had done, no matter what they were going through, God, Paul wanted them to be saved. He wanted... To preach the gospel. And that's what he was doing in bonds. And so this morning maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Maybe you say. I, I have never put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Today's the day. God will, God will take all the wrath of the sins that you've committed. To this point And through the end of your life. God will take all of that upon his son. And if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. He'll, he'll change you. And your, your eternal destination will be settled. You, can, you, you, you have two eternal destinations. You have heaven or hell. The only way you get to heaven is through placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's, and, and then all the other stuff makes sense. The rejoicing and tribulation. For unsaved people it makes no sense. The Bible talks about preaching is foolish to them that perish. It's foolish. But when you have your faith and trust in the right source... It becomes, it changes your perspective on life. So maybe this morning you never trusted Christ your Savior. Today's the day. Now is the only time you have. Come this morning, I can show you. My wife can show you. Any of the men can show you from the Bible how you can be saved. Or maybe you say, Brother Cody, I just need to be more bold. I need to be more bold in myself and in, in my testimony and, and living for Christ. You know, I don't have it that bad. Paul had it way worse. But I could do much better. I that's my prayer for myself. I think a lot of times, like I'm good at, at spreading the gospel, but, but how can I be better? So maybe that's you this morning. No matter what the situation, the altar is always open. Come this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you uh, for the ability to be in your house. God, thank you for 
uh, the message that was preached. God, help us to take it to heart. God, help us. Uh, help there, if there's anyone in this building that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, God, help them to come this morning so that we can show them from the Bible how that they can place their trust in you. God, help us to be more bold as Christians. God, just help us uh, to reach Stephenville for you. God, be with us. Guide us, direct us, and Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.